Book Interrupted is so grateful to our listeners for recommending us to your friends and family that we decided to run a contest to show our appreciation. One lucky fan will win a waterproof Amazon Kindle Oasis. Find out more at www.bookinterrupted.com slash contests. Parental guidance is recommended because this episode has mature topics and strong language. Here are some moments you can look forward to during this episode of Book Interrupted. White privilege and specifically to white women. My husband always gets me on that. He's like, you're um, a desktop activist. Literally society is white supremacy playing itself out just over and over again. And like, doesn't like your big brown face. Yeah. <laughs> In my case, we're going to get a lot of big face. brown face. So I have to just suck it up, yes. work on some resiliency work. Just, no, no, you don't get to decide that for me. You listen, Leah. I don't care what Twitter says. Sure. Giving them the space to have those emotions and feel those feelings, I think, is the yeah. point. My body and Disrupted. Mind, body, and soul. Inspiration is the uh, And we're gonna talk it uh, out. On book interrupted. This episode's brought to you by Liz Clark Astrology. No nonsense, personalized, honest, handwritten readings that aim to be as constructive and helpful as possible. A glimpse into your true self, maybe even one you forgot about. Go to www.lizclark.com. You can also find the link in our show notes below. Welcome to Book Interrupted, a book club for busy people to connect and one that celebrates life's interruptions. If you'd like to join along, this book cycle is from February 14th to March 21st. It's Kara's book cycle, and the book we're reading is Untamed by Glennon Doyle. Untamed is a memoir that examines the restrictive roles and expectations placed on women. For more information about Book Interrupted or this book cycle, please go to www.bookinterrupted.com. All right, so it's personal journal time. Let's see what the members of Book Interrupted thought outside the group. Here we have it. I'm back. Personal journal entry number two on my new favorite book, Untamed by Glennon Doyle. I am maybe a third of the way into the book and I only want to keep reading it. I don't want to do anything else. Here's the main observation about the book so far is I'm finding it quite fascinating because I don't understand how the author is getting to such depth and yet it's light. It's this very weird oxymoron, and I don't quite understand it. Maybe I don't need to understand it to continue enjoying the book. But man, I've got to say, what a breath of fresh air. It doesn't feel like to get through and digest the book, to take it in, to follow along and start to go on that journey. It is not burdensome in the least. It is absolutely the simplest, easiest thing to slip into and slip out of. In fact, I would say it's even a perfect book for this podcast, for this book club in particular, because we are all about trying to get some depth and meaning in our life, but constantly being called back up to the surface because of endless interruptions, right? Thank you, Glennon, for such a delightful read thus far. Hey, so this is my second personal journal for Untamed read through the first section and I love the stories. They really felt true and honest about her meeting her wife. I mean, the story of the shampoo bottles and how men get these like power tough, go, go, go. And women have to be, you know, gentle and delicate. And, you know, that bothers me. And all those things really made me feel something. And I, I, I liked her telling her story th- through stories as opposed to just shoving something in your face. And I was worried that this was going to be self-helpy. And I thought, oh, it's not. It's just going to be a story of her life. That's the kind of uh, motivational work that I'd like to read. And then I got to part two, which is the keys. And now I'm not so sure how I feel about this book. Uh, you know, getting into it was an imagination and imagining your beautiful life. You know, I love the concept. And then the knowing. So the know, oh, sorry, the knowing bit was first. You know, the meditation. I'm all for meditating as well. 
the God stuff really lost me. I'm not religious and I have a hard time reading things because I just don't understand that uh, attachment to faith. But she did it in an okay way where I felt like, you know, I don't know. She was losing me a bit. Then it got to burn and she kind of lost me. You know, I, I worry about the idea of, you know, imagining this beautiful life and saying that you need to do everything to make your beautiful life work and to burn all the things that don't make it work. And that's what I'm understanding so far. You know, I think that that sometimes makes you, you know, a, a bit selfish, to be honest. I think that sometimes you have to do things to sacrifice for the people that you love, things that you might not want to be doing right at that moment, whether it's, you know, picking up groceries for your mom or doing some kind of errand or doing whatever, because for your most beautiful life, you would be, you know, painting a picture or doing whatever. And I worry about teaching people that they can't, that they need to live their most beautiful life and that that means they can't have things in their life. Now, maybe the book goes on to that. And so I'm, I'm only in just finish the second section. So I'm open to, I'm hoping that that's not the message she's trying to share. For right now, that's what I'm getting. And I worry about that. Untamed is, I'm really liking it. I'm really, really liking it. Now, I'm really in the early stages still. The chapters are short, which just appeals to me because it feels like I'm banging it out. Banging out words. Reading, learning, check, 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 which I love. So that, like, pleases me to no end to be like, Look at how many chapters I read, (laughs) but they're like the world's smallest chapters. So that just makes me feel successful. And that just works every time. So I like that. She just seems like a likable character. I know character is what she seems like. And I love when she talks about her children, her daughter, I think Tish is the name she touches on. And it's like just her appreciation for a highly sensitive child, person, whatever, And her appreciation of that, like it's a superpower, just like touched my heart. And I like thinking about the like flip side to every every coin is like, you know, we all have this stuff, you know, like I'm super hyper and I have really high highs and really low lows. And sometimes I worry about what that means. And should I go for diagnosis and all those things? And then I try and see that, that there's a flip side to everything that you know, that I'm really interesting, that I'm really creative, that yeah, sometimes I'm spun and sometimes I'm really depressed, but sometimes that's what makes me interesting. And that's what I get stuff done. And then I need to recoup and put all the pieces back together. And there's a good and bad to everything. And that's really where I'm at right now, personally, in my own. I've just had such a hard time lately. The way she talked about her daughter really (laughs) just touched my little Leah that sat inside me. Gosh, I don't know why I'm crying. Anyways, I'm liking the book and it's really, I don't know, maybe just emotional today. (laughs) I like the book. I have some quotes here from it. Maybe I'll save those for the intro. I think this is enough for one PJ. Tears and all. (laughs) All right, y'all. See you later. I've lost a little bit of momentum, honestly. The first two sections I read quickly, you know, set up a thesis and then it told you how to also become untamed and things to do. And then the third section is a series of stories, each one with a lesson that Glennon learned and she wants to share with other people. And it talks about a lot of things, some of them more interesting than others. I'm kind of in a part where she's talking a lot about God, which I find a little boring. It's kind of a bit of a leap for me. I agree with listen to your intuition and learn about what you like and, you know, do you. There's a leap there, however, where she says, basically, that little voice inside you you're listening to is God. So I don't know. I don't know about that part. She's still relatable. She even says that if she goes back, she might find that some of these things she's saying might seem naive. And I respect that she's still putting them out there. Some things she says are naive. And that's okay. Because the book is about trying to grow and become better and doing hard things. So that's good. I'm ready to finish the book. I haven't picked up in a couple days. Mm, that's about it. I still like it. I think it's good. I think some people might look at her as an expert on how to become untamed because she wrote a book. And the third section kind of shows that she is still on that journey. And maybe that journey is a lifelong journey. That's about it.
So I feel like I got it wrong. I mean, I read the part of the book that people keep on quoting, and it was a conversation with her daughter. I think when you take it out of the, like the story of what she was trying to explain to her daughter, it does seem selfish. But when you read it in the book and you put the circumstances towards it, how she's trying to teach her daughter not to be in a cage, in my opinion, I think she's basically saying stop living a should life and living a could life. So I like the book. I'm enjoying reading it. She is basically just a person trying to figure out life and what she wants her life to look like and realizing that just checking off the boxes don't necessarily mean happiness. And like her, I learned that lesson. Like I did that too. Like I got a shock. I thought if I checked off all these boxes and lived a certain way, then I should have a happily ever after. And I didn't. And it kind of shook me as a young 20 year old, shook my soul. That it wasn't happily ever after. Why am I not happy if I have all these things? And I've checked up all the things I'm supposed to accomplish and do off my list and I'm not a happy person. So I, I like her because she's honest about her journey. And yeah, so I'm enjoying the book, Untamed. I think I'm probably enjoying it more that I didn't read her other two books. Like I, I allow her to realize that she's made mistakes in the past. And I like in the book how she was like, this is the horse shit I wrote in my first book that she was broken. I mean, there's parts in the book, like her personality wise that maybe I don't relate to necessarily, but but at the same time, I'm enjoying her book because it's very uh, authentic and she's being herself and she's, yeah, she's peeling her onion, as Kara would say. This is her next onion layer of realization of how she wants to live her life. So I like it. I like it for that. The best book ever. So this is called Knots for Abby. And this, I think, is one of the most impactful chapters of the book for me. I turned to you, touched your hand. I said, babe, wait. Yes. You were little. Your heart turned away from the church in order to protect yourself. You remained whole instead of letting them dismember you. You held on to who you were, born to be, instead of contorting yourself into who they told you to be. You stayed true to yourself instead of abandoning yourself. When you shut down your heart to the church or to that church, you did it to protect God in you. You did it to keep your wild. You thought that decision made you bad, but that decision made you holy. Abby, what I'm trying to say is that when you were very little, you did not choose yourself instead of God and church. You chose yourself and God instead of church. When you chose yourself, you chose God. When you walked away from church, you took God with you. God is in you. And tonight, you, me, and God, were just visiting church. We three came back for a visit to offer the folks here hope by telling stories about brave people like you who fight their whole lives to stay as whole and free as God made them. When we're done tonight, you and I will go and God will go with us. That's my favorite part of this whole book because I love it so much because she's so concise in her understanding. Like it's just truth. We were talking in our first episode about whether, you know, you should buy into this book because she has through like two previous books that during this book, she's kind of criticizing like, that wasn't me. I wasn't honest then. And we're like, well, what makes her honest now? Or you know, what makes this point of view more relevant or valid now? And um, for me, that, like, that is like the essence of truth. And I love it. This interruption is brought to you by Unpublished. Do you want to know more about the members and Book Interrupted? Go behind the scenes? Visit our website at www.bookinterrupted.com. Book Interrupted. Reading Untamed. And loving it. No interruptions. No interruptions on my end. I'm taking a bed day and I'm reading with the pup and the Leah and the bed and the book. Book interrupted. Let's listen in to this episode's group discussion. Here at Book Interrupted, we value discussions that are both open and respectful. Some listeners may find today's content triggering. During this week's episode, things got a little heated as we talked about tone policing, white fragility, and the lingering effects of colonialism. This group promotes equal rights and inclusivity and aims to establish an environment of mutual respect and sensitivity.
Right, so I was uh, reading some articles that had been written about Glennon Doyle and this book, and I found a difference in opinion. So some of them were glowing, like, you know, this is the best thing, everybody should read this type article. And then I came across one in the Seattle Times that said that this, it had a line saying something along the lines of this comes off as a book for rich white women. And so I started looking at what else was out there writing about this book or Glennon Doyle and Privilege. And I um, saw this article that I sent to all you ladies in the cut talking about how Glennon is using her platform, I suppose, to talk about white privilege and specifically to white women. This is an important and very uncomfortable conversation. And I think this is another thing that we can ask our viewers about because, and like Kim was saying, when we start talking about these things, we're going to screw up and we're going to say the wrong thing. One of the things she kind of says is a lot of white women will say, where do I start and how can I help? And the message is, it's already been started a long time ago. You don't have to start anything. You don't have to lead. There's other people leading. You can still help. Yeah, civil rights and stuff. Like, yeah, the article was really good. It was a really good. What do I, I'm going to lead and do this. And it's like, no, this is already being done. So touch base with the leaders that are doing it. And then show, and another thing she, that said in there, she was talking to her daughter, right? And her daughter's like, so did you go to any of those? Would we be marching in the civil rights march? Protests? Yeah, we'll be marching. And she was like, and she answered before her mom did. It was like, no, right? And that's the point. Like, maybe you just... Because we're not marching right now. Right. You show up and be part of it. But you're not the leader. You're just there. You're supporting the cause. Yeah, it's already happening. She learned that. She reports on that in the book, too, is because she attempts to, you know, contribute and she doesn't recognize or realize, she learns like the hard way. It's a good example of being open to mistakes that exactly what Mary's saying, the cause is well underway and it's not your job to save people of color. And so she gets pretty uh, lambasted anyways about what she thinks is like, she's like, oh, good for me. I'm really helping all those people that need all my help, right? And then she gets like, they're like, hey, there's people already doing this, like whatever. And so that is the underlying message is, you know, get behind the people of color who are working towards, they go ask them, let them, you know what I mean? Like that's the whole thing. It's not, it's, it's called white saviorism, right? And without being consciously aware, you may default to it and think that you're doing a very good thing. And uh, people of color, it actually just supports like supremacist and racist system if you participate in versions of white saviorism. It's funny also, she, yeah, and she, you know, like in the article how it says like you're just behind your computer supporting things. My husband always gets me on that. He's like, you're a desktop activist. Like, have you ever been to anything? I'm like, yeah, you're right. I haven't. Like I find every p petition you ever can. I share all these social issues that I believe in. And yeah, you just shared one yesterday on Twitter. Yeah. And then I also do things in my own life that support the causes I believe in and all that. But I'm not, I'm not, I'm not like, I'd, I've never been to a protest. Never. And that's called white exceptionalism, <laughs> where you like invest all this safe attention. And then when it comes to like, you know, well, you just have, you have areas where you're accepted, right? I don't, I don't have to do that. And you have whatever reason you have for why you don't have to do that. And it may not even be something that you examined because you convinced yourself, well, I'm doing this, I'm signing petitions, I'm yada, 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 yada. And so marches, you know, you don't even feel like you should be there until someone calls your attention to it. And you're like, oh, I read, read this article and then there's all these people listening to Glennon saying, hey, uh, wake up. And I mean, that's kind of part of the, I mean, it's part of the solution, but it's kind of part of the problem that it takes that for people to listen, right? Why? Okay, so this book that I was talking about in our in our WhatsApp thing, right? It's like that me and white supremacy, like even just the title is uncomfortable, right? Because you're like, wait a minute, there is no me and white supremacy, but there fully is because literally society is white supremacy playing itself out just over and over again. It's like the gender roles, how deeply ingrained into our everything it is, is like really scary for some people to realize like everybody is actually racist <laughs> like it's really hard to 
to understand it that way, because obviously everybody like, no, I'm not a racist. No, no, no. Because there's people who are, you know, aggressively racist, but like par- by participating in the system by default, like you're racist, like it's, and so the waking up so- of society or whatever is a huge, this is the job of the white people, like to dismantle the white system. You know what I'm saying? And it's just a, a really overwhelming idea that is very triggering for white people who, my, my, myself included, who want to think that you're educated in it or you're, you know, you're an activist or you're an ally. There's a lot of ways that, and by like, I don't want to get into an, an intention conversation because that's also an area that is risky business, but just by virtue of being raised in a white society, like a white supremacist society and being white, these things are in you as deep as your cells like you just don't even like they're blinders you can't even tell until someone draws your attention to it and then it's like holy and it's really uncomfortable to say the least but um well we scary like a whole bunch of things it's crazy and we talked about that when we set up this group because we are to be to tell all the listeners we are six white women and the idea of having six white women talk about books and stuff you know is something that we discussed, we are here to try to listen and learn and be open as much as we can. But, you know, unfortunately, we do live in this world. And, you know, hopefully we can learn from people also who are listening to us. And so we'd also talked about if any any of the listeners have any books that they would suggest that we read, we would love to hear from you. Yeah, and they could be part of the fan book. So they would be part of the discussion. One of the things I put on the website for fans is that we realize that we need fan engagement because it is valuable to us six people, but also I think valuable to, to what we're doing here because we need other perspectives. It's, it's helpful because that's a weakness for us. Yeah. Well, we want to include other perspectives and we want to also like speak in an educated way about topics that we don't have any experience in. Right. And there's nothing wrong with us being six white people, ex- unle- except for if we decide to start venturing into these areas that we do not have any dog in that fight, so to speak. That's when uh, the representation becomes a an important issue. And that is when the, where we are weak, because inevitably, by the virtue of who we are, we will, you know, venture into those areas. And that we wanted to the best of our ability, show ourselves messing up, knowing that it might come <laughs> at the cost of some really important comments or feedback back to us that we may not want to receive. No, but I think we should. You know, like that we have to be willing. Absolutely. And we are willing. Like I even know myself, like, I think we all have feelings about it. And I think we all see, you know, that there's a problem. What can we do? And, you know, it's kind of um, paralyzing. If you meet your like, I can't do this right now, that's fine. But I would love it. There used to be a night like a nighttime talk show, you know, like Jimmy Fallon kind of shit that was like, they'd make the person read the worst tweet about them. Like a famous person. Mean tweets. Yeah. I love that. Mean tweets. It's the best thing ever. Yeah. Mean tweets. It was so funny. It was Kimmel. I think it was Kimmel. And I would love to do that as a group so that we could support each other through it and be like, you know, I, I did fuck up. Cause I, I just, I can't, I can't listen to anything that I does, don't that feels overproduced and feels unauthentic. And I don't think it's a weakness in our group that we're six white girls. I think we're authentically Sarah's friends. And that's there's nothing to be ashamed of that. And if we want a perspective, we'll 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 get we'll get them. I hope we do. I hope we're popular enough to even have fans to hate on us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Me too. laughs> so I'm welcoming it because I think like hearing nobody thinks worse thoughts about themselves than me. So, like, let's hear it. And, like, yeah, it's going to fucking suck. And Lindsay, she has, she's lived it, so she knows, having had her blog and stuff. And that not that where you would agree? That's where all the learning happened. Yeah, definitely. I definitely learned and grew and realized my mistakes. You know, all some of it was a little harsh and was hard. A little harsh, yeah. And it is just that. It is just reading words like it is it's a fucking toaster it's if you don't want to read it just turn it off power down the phone 
Well, part of the, like, part of the important thing to the, like, the work, if we want to, you know, become involved in the work of, like, uh, decolonization and anti-racism is accepting that there will be moments of embarrassment, humiliation, mistakes, and being open to the correction that will come from the people who are, let's say, we're generous enough to take a moment to correct us. And that's, that's like one of the hardest parts of the journey and one of the most necessary parts of the journey, right? But for me personally, to wrap my head around the idea of like, that is how it's, that's how it happens. So it gives myself permission because the, the perfectionism or the not wanting to be viewed as racist or as saying something offensive or all and on and on and on, all of the things that you want to avoid, including them into like, this will happen and you'll be okay. And, and like, et cetera, et cetera, that like the quote you read. Yeah. Like the quote you read, we can do hard things. Yes, totally, totally, also. totally. That's brave. And yeah, I, and uh, things can happen and I'll still live. And be critical about the comment. Like someone who's just sounding off, calling you a, a cunt and like, doesn't like your big round face. My big round face. <laughs> <laughs> in my case, I'm going to get a lot of big round face, <laughs> and, but that's not the things we're going to read and give you feedback that you should read. Yeah. You're very good at exercising like who you do before you take any advice, Leah, you're very good at looking at the source. I have a question though. Does anyone else get hung up on the etiquettes of what is the word? The way in which, like, do I need to just drop this? Cause like okay, part of my work as a human is not being so sensitive, just open to the words and not necessarily the delivery. Sometimes it seems like the people that are offering the comments and the constructive feedback and the points on uh, maybe where more learnings could happen. And is it just me who thinks that some people not only deliver a good message, but maybe they do it a bit more harshly than it needs to be done. So uh, again, because of this book, there is a, a, a thing that um, white people often struggle with called tone policing. Is that what it's called? Yeah. If, if a person of color is delivering a message to you and it's in a certain way and uh, it's basically the bottom line is it's not okay for you to say, you know, calm down. Can you deliver that information to me, you know, less aggressively or whatever that's called? Like it's, it's tone policing and we're just, it's not okay for us to do that. Oh, so I have to just suck it up, yes. work on some resiliency and work. Just say thank you. And just say. Thank you for telling me. Like, thank you for being gener generous enough to share Regardless of their delivery, even yes. if it's beyond, like it is inappropriate. No, I don't think that's true. No, no, you don't get to decide that. You listen, me. Leah, the I don't care what Twitter says. I'm not talking about Twitter. I'm talking about in a conversation about race, if a person of color is sharing with you something that you've said that might not be appropriate or is offensive or is hurtful or whatever, it's not for a white person to tell a person of color how they feel. So if they feel a certain kind of way and they're expressing themselves to you based in that feeling, it's very unhealthy in, in anti-racist work for you to try to ask them to feel a different way or to show how they feel by talking to you in a different way. It's just not... It's the feeling your feelings thing. And when somebody is trying to tell you something that hurt them or is still hurting them, it's hard not to say that in a defensive way. Like, imagine if somebody hurt you and you're trying to tell them, you hurt me. Um, and they're like, yes, but can you tell it to me in a happy way? <laughs> you know, like. But it, that's not like a black thing or a white thing or an any race thing. That's just a human thing. But, the, okay, well, the thing, too, is, like, it's valid what you're saying, Leah, but um, it is a black thing and a white thing and a, and a human thing altogether because, um, in terms of tone policing, if your sole message is to tell someone who is a person of color who is angry and rightfully so, and they're expressing themselves angrily to you for you to be like, could you uh, just tone it down a bit? It's not okay. It's just not okay. Okay. So this is what I know is that 
Yes. So imagine, instead of saying people of color, let's say women, because you can relate to that. Every time you get angry, someone says to you, you always, you always lose control. Why are you crying? So that happens to women, right? Why are you crying? Why are you getting so emotional? Because you're trying to express you're upset about something. So now switch that from women to people of color and their narrative is, I didn't mean to offend you. I don't know why you're losing your temper all the time. So imagine that someone's constantly be told that narrative. Yeah, why don't you just get over it already? People say that. Why don't they just get over it already? Right, so when you do it to them, they're like, it's just this thing that happens to them all the time that they're not allowed to get angry. So the point is, is that it's like, uh, like me at work, like I'd never want to cry, but sometimes someone would get me so upset that I would cry. And then in my mind, I'd be like, damn it. And that's when a male in my company would be like, he wouldn't say, I'll, I'll start listening when you can pull yourself together. Got it. Yeah. I understand everything that you're saying. I'm saying you're talking all, all people in all, I think there's a case by case scenario for everything. And I don't think that you can make a rule and you can't always, just like I wouldn't want to tone shame someone for my own reasons. The, you can't make a rule that says, I have to say thank you. But I, I think maybe this is the point is that, um, like, I totally get if someone's attacking you, you're going to get upset. But at the same time... I don't know. I have n I've never been attacked by someone on this issue. Fair. But at the same time, we already just by the color of our skin have a certain privilege and a certain... So letting somebody talk about whatever is making them upset that you're doing directly to them, giving them the space to have those emotions and feel those feelings, I think is the point. So then you're like, okay, I accept. Let me listen. Let me let you have your space. And then thanks for letting me know. And let's have a discussion about this. Oh, yeah. Well, that would just be my inclination. I just didn't realize that there was a rule. I, I guess I reacted to it was like, well, I'm not going to go by a rule, by some book, by some author that I've never met. The rule by the author that you've never met is is like a pretty acclaimed book about anti-racist work, right? So it's not just some random person saying like they're... I don't think like, that they're random opinion or I know but you're saying like it's a it's some author that I've never met or whatever this person is you know educated in the work and is trying to offer almost like a training guide or a how-to guide for how white people can in the least hurtful or harmful way show up to do the work that we all are on the same page and want to do like I haven't read the book but if some a person of color chooses to correct you or to let you know that what you've said is offensive and they say say so in a way that upsets you, you'll be in an, a gray zone of tone policing and you may want to be aware of the way you receive their information. That's all I'm saying. Okay. But it's up to you. Always it's up to you. It's always up to you. Okay, that's what I want to know. We need to name some things that are inherent in our whiteness that we might do, whether we do it consciously or unconsciously. It's we're back to the name it thing. And then once we can name it, we can think about if this happens, if I find myself in this situation, what would I do? And so like, if you can think about it ahead of time and said, how, how can I make space? That's why we have these conversations. So if we find ourselves in these situations, uh, we can try to respond in a way that we could be proud of. Yeah. No, it's good because now, yeah, I feel like we learned a new thing. Yeah. And now Sarah could say to... Uh, me, Sarah could say, okay, Kara, are you having issues with the words and feedback that was given to you? Or are you having issues with the tone and delivery? And now I would have a way in to check in with myself and say, you're right. I was just, I was focusing on the delivery. And there's nothing wrong with having these. The point is, I think the main point is there's nothing wrong with having these discussions is the point. Right? My book choice, Nonviolent Communication, which I really love. Some people have criticized it as a people using it as a possible way to tone police. So that's something to think about going when you read that book, when you're communicating with somebody, are you using nonviolent communication in a respectful way or a disrespectful way? Anyway, something to think about <laughs> when you read it. Anyway. 
I just want to show the book so we can reckon. Oh, and look. Oh, this is funny. Okay, so here's the book. This circle is a quote from Elizabeth Gilbert. And one of the uh, things I was going to talk about was how Glennon Doyle knows Elizabeth Gilbert. And Elizabeth Gilbert wrote my last Bible, Eat, Pray, Love. So isn't that interesting? There's a thread through all of it. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Book Interrupted. If you'd like to see the video highlights from this episode, please go to our YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe and you'll be notified when there's new content. Book Interrupted has partnered with Libro FM for a fan giveaway. Fans that contribute to the Untamed Book Cycle will be entered to win a three-month free membership to Libro FM. Fans can contribute by sending us an email, a video, leaving a voice message for us, or commenting on our social media. For more information on how to get hold of us, please go to www.bookinterrupted.com. Moments you can look forward to on next week's Book Interrupted. Turned into a different conversation and I was really rattled. Personally want to apologize. I feel like you were feeling protective of Kara. I'm not going to let someone attack my sister. Something missing, I think, in our culture with this me culture. Overvalue the opinions of others. So I need to separate myself from people to be able to make the choice for myself. Because you got to live with yourself in the end. Book interrupted.